Echocardiography is the primary technique to diagnose aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation is a fairly common finding, which is easy to detect, but sometimes very difficult to quantify. Let's take a look at what the learning objectives are. We'll learn how to understand the pathophysiology of aortic regurgitation, find out what the causes of aortic regurgitation are, we'll find out what can be seen with conventional two-dimensional echo and also with color, we'll learn how to quantify aortic regurgitation, find out what the limitations of echo are, and we'll find out what you do if you have a patient with aortic regurgitation. Let's first talk about the basics of aortic regurgitation. What are the causes? How frequent does it occur? What are the hemodynamic sequels of aortic regurgitation? And what can we see in the two-dimensional image? The causes of chronic aortic regurgitation are many. Previously, it was rheumatic heart disease, which was one of the most common causes, but with uh, the advent of antibiotics, this cause has been reduced dramatically. Now, we probably see most, cause, most uh, forms of aortic regurgitation caused by degenerative changes of the aortic valve, as you would see them here in a patient who also has aortic stenosis. We have congenital defects of the aortic valve, which can cause aortic regurgitation. Dilatation of the aorta, as already mentioned, rheumatic heart disease. Patients who suffered an endocarditis with destruction of the aortic valve can develop aortic regurgitation. And some patients have aortic valve prolapse from many causes, which you will see. What are the hemodynamics of aortic regurgitation? Well, the problem is that we have regurgitant flow coming back from the aorta into the left ventricle. This means that the left ventricle has to accommodate more volume. In addition, there's also more forward flow across the aorta because this volume again has to be ejected back into the aorta. So, in summary, we have a volume overloaded left ventricle, which is dilated, which is hyperdynamic, and if the left ventricle begins to fail, we start to see elevated left atrial filling pressures. What is very important is that patients with aortic regurgitation also have an elevated after, afterload. This will be become important, especially when we talk about the management of aortic regurgitation. This shows you a pressure tracing between the aorta and the left ventricle. This tracing here is the tracing of pressure in the left ventricle, while this is the pressure here in the, in the aorta. What happens during a diastole is that you have a fairly rapid uh, pressure equilibration between the aorta and the left ventricle caused by regurgitant flow which comes back into the left ventricle. Thereby, the end diastolic pressure in the aorta is low. This is also the reason why you have low diastolic blood pressures in patients with aortic regurgitation. This also explains why you have a strong pulsatility in the vessels as can be seen also in a suprasternal view here in the aorta. We see that there's much pulsatility which is visible even in the two-dimensional image. Further findings include, as already mentioned, a dilated left ventricle, a hyperdynamic left ventricular function. We also see eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy. In other words, we have hypertrophy in combination with a dilated left ventricle. The left atrium is usually normal in size, at least at the beginning, and then gradually starts to increase in size, but not to the same degree as we would, for example, see it in patients who have mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. Finally, if the left ventricle dilates further, we start to get increased mitral annular dilatation, which causes secondary mitral regurgitation in some patients. This is an MO tracing of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, which shows you flutter of the anterior leaflet, which is caused by an eccentric jet which blows into the anterior mitral valve leaflet during diastole, a phenomena which is frequently seen and which can also be heard. This, is, this actually corresponds to the so-called Austin Flint murmur. What else can be seen in many patients? A dilated aorta, 
The dilatation of the aorta can either be the cause of aortic regurgitation or can be associated with patients who have bicuspid valves who often frequently have regurgitation. If you perform echocardiography in patients with aortic regurgitation, it's also important to look at the aortic valve. This can help you to determine what the etiology of aortic regurgitation is and can help you to decide if the valve can actually be repaired. Let's take a look at the morphology of an aortic valve in a typical patient with aortic regurgitation. Let's take a look at this patient now with respect to his aortic valve. We'll start with a parasternal long axis view. And we can appreciate that the patient has a mildly thickened aortic valve, but there are no calcifications. But we also see that the motion of the aortic valve is abnormal. There is doming of the aortic valve. Here in systole, there's doming of the valve. And in addition, the ascending aorta is also dilated. So this together with the morphology of the valve is almost indicative of a bicuspid aortic valve. And we can exactly see the morphology of the valve here in the short axis view and it's clear that the patient only has two cusps opposed to three. But we also note that the valve opens quite nicely and we do not have the impression that the valve is stenotic. Let's take a look at a few patients who have aortic regurgitation. This patient here on the top has a prolapse of the right coronary cusp. These patients often have a very eccentric jet which is pointed towards the anterior mitral valve leaflet. This shows you a patient who had endocarditis. You can still note the residual vegetation and thickening of the right coronary cusp and the endocarditis caused destruction of the aortic valve and thereby regurgitation. Here we have a patient with a bicuspid valve. There are two cusps, one here and one here. These patients also have regurgitation very commonly as we will see in the next slide. And here on the bottom, a patient with rheumatic heart disease who has mitral stenosis and where the rheumatic heart disease also affected the aortic valve, thereby causing some degree of doming and thickening and this leads to aortic regurgitation as well. Let's turn to bicuspid valves and aortic regurgitation. Again, here a patient who has only two cusps, a classic bicuspid aortic valve. We know that approximately 70% of patients with bicuspid valves also have aortic regurgitation. And the presence of aortic regurgitation is independent of the presence of aortic stenosis. We also know that the aortic regurgitation correlates with the aortic size. So the larger the aorta is, the more frequently will we see aortic regurgitation and usually the more severe it is. Patients with bicuspid valves also have eccentric jets very commonly. This is a finding that you will also see in patients with aortic regurgitation. Alone with two-dimensional imaging, we can actually see the closure defect of the aortic valve. This is a tricuspid valve where the free edges are thickened, but you will see that during diastole there's a small defect here in the region of the aortic valve which denotes the regurgitant orifice actually. Another patient here who has a large aortic root and three cusps shows you a central closure defect during diastole. But now let's go back to our patient we saw previously with a bicuspid valve and take a look what other findings we can find. Let's take a look at our patient. So in the peristern long axis view, it is clear that the size of the left ventricle is not normal but that it is actually enlarged. We can appreciate that also in the short axis. This is the short axis view. And it's also apparent that the patient has hyperdynamic left ventricular function. Let's see how large the left ventricle is. 
So we have an end diastolic diameter of 64 millimeters, which is significantly enlarged. An end systolic diameter of 40 millimeters and a fractional shortening of 37 percent. So it's normal to hyperdynamic. This can also be seen here in the four chamber view. Hyperdynamic left ventricular function. Let's see how large the left ventricle really is. We'll calculate the end diastolic volume. We probably have some degree of foreshortening here, so we probably underestimate the true volume of the ventricle. But we do get 150 milliliters, which means that the patient has at least a moderately dilated left ventricle. The left, ventricle, the left ventricular function was calculated with 67 to 72 percent, so altogether we have signs of volume overload. And this together with the color Doppler and the continuous wave Doppler will then lead us to the diagnosis or to the severity of aortic regurgitation. So this shows you that alone with two-dimensional echocardiography, we can get a lot of information in patients with aortic regurgitation. We don't always have to turn on the color to suspect aortic regurgitation. And as you will see in the next section, two-dimensional echocardiography will also help you in the quantification of patients with AR.